I hope you are having a great time at KubeCon and enjoy some interesting sessions over the last two days. And I'm hoping today you're gonna enjoy the same. Um, thank you for joining me today. Kubernetes is complex and it takes a lot of uh, you know, challenges to uh, build something behind the scenes. And one of the components that is actually using that is Linux C group. The backbone behind the container resource control that limits and prioritizes CPU, disk, and memory. If you ever wonder uh, why your uh, container you know, gets umkilled despite setting the memory limits, or why CPU uh, gets, you know, uh, because of a uh, thing where you feel like, you know, it's getting out of control. You might be uh, come across a thing called uh, C groups, which is impacting your applications. So in today's sessions, we're gonna talk about something which is really important uh, for someone who is working with Kubernetes, that is the transition from C group V1 to V2. That shift will impact the resource management, uh, performance, and the, the resource control and uh, the workload compatibility. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Sohan Kunkerkar. I work at Red Hat as a senior software engineer. I'm one of the cryo maintainers and a member of SIGNODE, which works predominantly on uh, Kubelet uh, and Node-specific projects. If I'm not working, I'll be either playing flute or enjoying trekking and outdoor activities. So. Um, Here's the agenda for today's talk. We'll be uh, covering the first part where we'll be talking about the foundation of C group followed by the migration process. And in the second half, we'll talk about the impact while doing the transition and think about the future outlook. So can I get a quick show of hands how many of you are using C group V2 in their production clusters? That's good. And how about V1? All right, so uh, with this talk, my intention is uh, towards the end of this session, I can pursue towards moving to V2. So let's get started. So uh, uh, before that, I want to make sure that we are on the same page. So I will we'll quickly touch base on what is C group exactly. C group is a Linux kernel feature that manages the system resources. So you can actually uh, see, you, know, you can control the CPU, memory, and disk IO for, for the process. C group, you can imagine as it, it can actually, uh, you know, um, impose the limit on the resource usage. At the same time, it can monitor uh, the performance of the group resources and also controls the scheduling and prioritization. One of the important part of uh, C group is it doesn't allow any single process to hog up the entire pro uh, resources. And it also has, um, you know, it controls the uh, process isolation and it also helps in uh, 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 performance optimization. So we leverage these C groups uh, in a multi-tenant environment, uh, such as cloud computing or container-based deployments. So let's understand uh, how C group was there. Like, you know, it started with V1, and you can find uh, the C group file system under sysfs C group. So there are a bunch of things there. You know, you can find subtrees under the Linux process, and the Linux uh, community started with V1, where it was pretty basic with basic resource management where you can see uh, on the screen where you will have each resource will have you know a bunch of subtrees so the thing is here uh, you know uh, this can lead to complexity when managing the multiple resources and that's where linux community uh, came up with C, uh, v2 where you can see here it's a, a unified one and a constant interface so uh, in this structure all resources come under the same unified hierarchy and which definitely helps in resource management and um, monitoring the processes So let's let's understand. Now we know we have two versions. Uh, let's understand the limitations of V1, and we can then uh, talk about the shortcomings uh, that are addressed by V2, and then the couple of features that are introduced with V2. So with V1, what's really happening is uh, it has multiple independent hierarchies. So in C group V1 controller, each uh, resource type has like the CPU, memory, and I/O is managed by se uh, separate hierarchies. So this creates added complexity for admins who wants to really manage the resources and um, want to configure certain things. But because of the each resource hierarchy, it would be difficult for someone to actually manage that, and uh, it might lead to some misconfiguration. The second th th thing is lack of, lack of coordination among different controllers. So um, controllers like CPU memory, 
in C group V2 uh, operate independently and making it difficult to coordinate across, uh, you know, effectively across different things. And uh, that's where uh, it leads to performance problem uh, under heavy load. Third thing is about uh, inconsistent API design, where um, the API in C group V1 um, lacks cons uh, uh, consistency. And there are a couple of attachment rules for the processes, which is really difficult to follow, and that might lead to um, or, uh, you know, uh, confusing in the management and error prone. And last but not the least, as the number of C, C groups get increases, uh, C group lacks, um, you know, C group lacks the scalability because it manages, uh, each resource will have its own hierarchy. At some point of time, uh, it's going to get bursted because, um, you know, as uh, the number of pods is increases, it cannot handle that uh, particular resources. And in order to solve this issue, we uh, Linux kernel community came up with uh, C group V2, where with its unified hierarchy, it not only solves the better utilization of the resources and uh, pressure handling, it also helps in enhancing the memory and uh, CPU controllers. Now, uh, apart from shortcomings, C group V2 also has a couple of features. I'm gonna name two. Uh, the first is thread mode, where uh, it allows individual threads to create a separate uh, C group with which you can actually set the CPU and memory limits for a thread instead of the entire process. And the second is explicit delegation. So in explicit delegation mechanism, you are grant granting control over, um, over a subtree of the C group uh, to a non-root user. So what really happens in that case, it basically allows you uh, to have a securely and confidently you can uh, delegate that without uh, losing the system stability. Uh, now let's understand C group in Kubernetes. But before that, I want to uh, kind of walk you through this timeline and uh, how Linux kernel started with uh, C group V1. So they introduced that in uh, 2008 uh, with C group V1, and then uh, in uh, 2016 they came up with uh, C group V2. If you see Kubernetes timeline, Kubernetes was born in 2014, where uh, we started V1, and it took us like uh, almost uh, six years to go to V2. So the idea behind this timeline to make you realize that C group V2, though C group V2 was stabilized in 2016 in Linux kernel, Kubernetes ecosystem took uh, some time to soak that change in Linux kernel before um, uh, pulling that into cube releases. So you could see here, like, you know, 2020 we started, we, uh, Kubernetes has its own way of graduating uh, features, let that be Linux feature or any feature. So we started with alpha, uh, then uh, beta was there in uh, 2021 and then 22, we went with uh, GA. And subsequently, container runtime support also started supporting uh, C group V2. So uh, the idea behind this uh, particular slide is to make you realize that it was a cautious decision to make sure that uh, we get the best features with stability. Now let's understand uh, C groups uh, in, in uh, Kubernetes. So Kubernetes rely heavily on C groups to manage and isolate resources consumed by uh, containers in pods. So uh, uh, besides being a Linux primitive, C group is the basic building block of containers. So you can think of this as without uh, C group, there is no containers. I'll tell you, I'll explain you in detail as to what, what I'm talking about. But before that, uh, let's, let's uh, discuss how Kubernetes is actually uh, leveraging some of the features from C group. The first one is resource allocation. So C group uh, ensures that containers do not exceed their CPU and memory limits. With isolation, it isolates uh, each con uh, isolates the containers from each other to uh, to make sure it has a resource contention. And last but not the least, monitoring, where it tracks the resource usage uh, to make sure um, we get the insights and metrics. We can do that with C Advisor today, which is already integrated with Kubelet, and um, I will show you one demo after this where we will walk you through C group's path and uh, we'll be using this pod spec. So um, before that, I just want to explain a few things about this pod. As you can see, we are trying to uh, set the requests and limits at the container level. So um, with this, what Kubernetes is going to do, it's going to create pod inside sysfs C group, that's the C group file system. And inside that, uh, we have uh, this feature called memory QoS which is still in alpha in Kubernetes. What it does based on your limits, 
it will create uh, either burstable pod, guaranteed pod, or best effort pod. If your request and limits matches, um, matches like, uh, in terms of the memory, then uh, it will have the guaranteed pod. If the, if, uh, if the memory for the request is less than the limits, then it will go to um, burstable. Otherwise, if you don't mention anything, it will fall under best effort. So uh, let me go ahead and play this video. So uh, in this demo, I'm uh, using um, Kubernetes cluster with C group V2 enable, C group V2 enable, and um, I'm using Cryo as the container runtime interface. So cluster is already running. Uh, let's uh, let's see uh, the pod spec. I'm almost using the same pod spec with few uh, changes so that it can work on my system. Uh, let's go ahead and create the pod. So it will take some time to get into running state. All right. Now, uh, what we can do, we'll go ahead and use crycuttle uh, to see the container ID. Uh, so you can see the web server is running with the container ID. So I'm, what, uh, with this container ID, I'm going to use crycuttle inspect, and we'll look for the C groups path. So it's a JSON file, I'm just going to use a JQ to kind of go through that C groups uh, path directly. Yeah, so what really happens here, like, uh, you know, you are creating a pod and you are instructing uh, the node that, you know, the pod should get created. And Kubelet will basically ask CRI to create pod for you. And Kubelet will ask uh, CRI and CRI in turn gives OCI specific JSON to uh, any uh, underlying uh, runtime. Let that be run C or C run to make sure you create that pod. So that's how when you do Kaikatal inspect, you will basically see um, the container spec with all the remit and resources. But for the time being, I'm sticking to only C groups path. So it is... All right, so you can see here, it comes under burstable uh, pod because, um, you know, uh, the limit request limit is less than, uh, request memory is less than the limit memory. You can also use system the GLS to uh, uh, see the hierarchy. So you can see here, uh, we have a burstable pod, under that we have a pod, and under that we have container. Uh, let's quickly see the system D properties for a container. So what the system property does, it basically uh, gives you idea what uh, values they're going to set for the C groups that are there inside that folder. So I'm going to um, quickly see that, yeah. So you can see CPU weight that uh, we're gonna see in a bit. And um, we'll also go inside CSFS to see the exact value. Yeah, so we have those things. And now we'll go inside that uh, folder to make sure we have the respective values. So the first one is uh, CPU. CPU dot weight, that will uh, give you um, the priority for it which is 10, then we have CPU max, that will give you uh, what we set for the limits, CPU limits for the pod spec. We'll also see memory min. All right, I'm gonna just stop here. All right, can you see memory min here is zero? So uh, when I actually spin up the cluster, at that time I didn't enable uh, memory QoS feature, and that's the reason it's set to zero. Um, so it doesn't apply the kubelet logic where if it is under, it falls under burstable and uh, if you enable Q, um, a QoS feature, then it will do some calculation behind the scene and it will give you some value. But currently that uh, feature is not enabled and that's why it is showing a zero. And last but not the least, uh, CPU uh, memory dot max. So uh, 
before that, we saw how how the resource get uh, got tracked. Now let's understand how it get monitored using C advisor. So what I'm going to do here is like we are going to uh, hit the URL uh, to to see the container specific metrics. So I've already created a kubectl proxy behind the scene. So um, that ID is already there. I'm just going ahead and kind of uh, querying that. So what you see here is the same thing. What uh, when you go inside CFS C group and uh, trying to kind of go through each and every file to look for the values. So this is the easiest way to query any um, uh, metrics rather than going inside uh, C group uh, files. Right. Cool. So with this demo. Um, Let's understand, now we know about C group in Kubernetes, let's understand uh, the benefits of C group V2 in uh, Kubernetes. Uh, we talked about uh, memory QoS uh, in, in the previous slide, but let's discuss what that means uh, for uh, Kubernetes. So it allows for fine-grained allocation, memory allocation. So what Kubernetes does is like it basically um, uh, prioritizes memory for critical applications. And uh, it, it reduces the risk for um, the slowdowns or crashes. Uh, in essential services under high usage. So behind the scene, what it using is, it's actually using memory.min to give guaranteed memory. Uh, uh, so if I would have uh, tweaked that with memory QoS, like if I would have added feature get, then it would have given that value. Um, the second part is uh, swap support. So uh, with improved swap support, uh, C group V2 helps us um, use uh, swap, you know, uh, very effectively. And this also enables us to handle memory over commitment um, situation gracefully. So with uh, swap support, you can actually use memory.swap.max. Uh, th th this is only available in C, uh, C group V2 um, uh, to make sure you basically use swaps um, uh, space when uh, there's a problem with memory over commitment. And this use case, I mean, um, this is normally used in telco cases where you need a swap support in case uh, the memory goes um, haywire. Then uh, let's discuss about CPU load protection. So CPU load protection is one of the, um, uh, you know, uh, another important feature. It makes sure that uh, it, uh, the critical uh, processes from um, CPU over commitment during heavy uh, load um, uh, period. So uh, C group V2 behind the scene uses CPU load balancing to make sure that um, it uh, it stick to the um, uh, resources what he ha what it has at the same time um, it doesn't um, uh, you know falls under CPU or commitment issue and uh, with PSI that's pressure stall information you can actually see and track the metrics and uh, you can take the uh, scheduling decision on the fly and that is really important we basically use uh, PSI and memory dot max. Uh, to uh, to uh, make sure uh, we have memory intensive workloads and that should be properly deployed on Kubernetes. We'll discuss this, uh, uh, discuss this later in the slide, but I just want to give you that highlight. Uh, then uh, it comes to eBPF um, based resource management. With C group V2, uh, integrates EBF, uh, eBPF based resource management, a lightweight way of dynamically uh, you know, monitor and control resources at the kernel level. So uh, one of the crucial part is eBPF uh, integrates really well with C group V2 because of its unified hierarchy. So it will have like, you know, all resources will come under the same hierarchy rather than the separate uh, resource will have the separate. Uh, so compared to uh, V1, V2 has better um, um, hierarchy structure. And last but not the least, but I think uh, I have added one more after attending uh, yesterday's Signode meeting where uh, Mrunal basically discussed about um, pod level resources. So I think a few days back that PR got merged, so I'll also discuss that. But before that, nested containers. So C group V2 supports better isolation and management for nested containers, So which is essential for complex applications where it requires multiple layers of containers. I see this also improves the security and resource separation in a more um, intricate microservices setup. So. Um, with this, the last is uh, pod level resources. So um, in the pre previous slide, I was talking about the pod spec where uh, we were actually mentioning uh, limits for the container. But in this case, what's really happening is like, 
you can mention limits for a pod instead of mentioning for the containers. So um, as a user, I don't want to think about containers. I want to think more from the pod perspective, how we are going to set the limits for pod instead of going inside containers and looking for each and every stuff. So that is really important um, uh, from the user's perspective. And <clears throat> this feature recently got merged and it's, it's in alpha state probably for 1.32. All right, so uh, now we know about the benefits. Let's understand the migration process, which is, which is uh, very well uh, listed in Kubernetes documentation and blogs. So um, before you go to, um, before you try to, uh, you know, install uh, C group V2 specific stuff, you need to make sure that you have the prerequisites in place. The first one is about um, the Kubernetes release, like, you know, Kubernetes supports uh, C group V2 with 1.25 plus, and uh, you need a specific container in time. You can choose any of the followings. You just need to make sure that it uh, follows the version. And the Linux kernel, uh, which is 5.8 plus. So once you have the prerequisites, the next part is about uh, planning. <clears throat> so um, so in planning, you need to make sure that uh, your, your node supports um, the C group V2 server. So sometimes we'll discuss that later about the infrastructure adoption. But um, if your node doesn't support C group V2, then you might need to make sure that you need to change the version for OS in order to get, uh, 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 in order to make sure you can, uh, you know, uh, switch to V2 smoothly. And <clears throat> you need to also audit the workloads. So um, there's a case where your uh, infrastructure is already on V2, but your application is not supporting V2 specific features. So something like uh, min do, uh, memory dot min, memory dot max, those features you cannot use because um, your application is developed in a such a way that it, it utilizes C group V1 hierarchy. We'll also discuss that later, but I want to give you that point. And uh, last but not the least, once you have everything in place, the migration process is pretty much similar to uh, every other things where how you basically introduce Kubernetes change. And once you have that, you just need to kind of uh, verify and see if uh, C group V2 is enabled. And not go uh, too much detail into it. All right, so uh, as I was talking about infrastructure adoption, so, um, you know, um, when it comes to um, C group V2, it's not just about Kubernetes being ready, it's about the entire stack being ready, you know, starting with Linux kernel, Kubernetes, container runtimes, system D and a couple of projects around uh, Kubernetes ecosystem. So uh, when it comes to operating system, Rail 10, which is going beta in few, uh, few months, already uh, defaulted to C group V2, and there are a couple of other operating systems. We also have Kubernetes distribution who started give, uh, supporting C group V2 by default, though they have this flexibility to support C group V1 by making few changes, but um, this is where it stands. and. Other requirements include Linux kernel and container D stuff that we already discussed in the prerequisites. All right, these are some of the projects um, that already support C group V2 by default. Not, not exclusively, but there are other projects, but I thought like to uh, include this, which, um, which revolves around container runtime and kubelet. All right, uh, language compatibility. So uh, someone might ask this question, why do we need language compatibility, uh, you know, especially for C group? So I'll tell you, like, you know, um, let's talk about Java. So uh, Java developers, you know, uh, in JDK, they always look for C group files inside uh, C group files to understand memory and CPU, um, CPU limits uh, for, uh, for a particular uh, system. So uh, with C group V1 versus V2, if you could see the hierarchy uh, changes, it would be difficult uh, for someone who is building Java application to kind of uh, see the underlying uh, thing. And based on that, if they've made any assumption and if they build uh, application, it would be difficult to um, kind of, uh, you know, uh, deploy, deploy that uh, on the platform because platform is already on C group V2. So there are a couple of languages here uh, which, uh, which already started supporting C group V2. It's, it's just a matter of version requirements and how you need to configure uh, this thing. So. Uh, I just want to leave you this with uh, this particular table and uh, make you familiarize with that. I'm, do I'm not going to go detail into it, but just want to give you this highlight. Now, uh, we talked about 
language compatibility, let's also understand optimizing workload performance using C group P2. Uh, we already discussed memory intensive applications. So uh, for memory uh, intensive, the moment I say memory intensive, it's always about uh, using a lot of memory. So C group V2 specifically offers features like memory dot high uh, for fine tuning memory application. Uh, together you can use PSI, pressure stall information, metrics to detect, um, uh, to detect memory pressure early. So this will help you prevent unexpected performance dip. So um, if you see here, you can actually use memory dot high to set soft limit and uh, memory uh, you know, monitor pressure uh, PSI for early detection of the memory pressure. When it comes to CPU bound application, uh, it uses CPU dot max to help you manage throttling um, uh, more effectively. And uh, uh, together you can actually use uh, quality of service that we already discussed, uh, one of the class, to make sure you set the clear priorities and adjust the resource distribution accordingly. When it comes to IO uh, heavy, um, IO heavy, with IO heavy, you can actually use IO.max and IO.weight, uh, which you could get from C group V2. So you can set the bandwidth limit uh, with the help of IO.max, and you can adjust the prioritization for IO dot weight. Um, it's also important for latency specific application. And last but not the least, MLN AI workloads, which is very important nowadays. So uh, C group V2 basically enhances hierarchical uh, control over uh, the device access and prioritization. So this is critical for high performance um, the scenarios where GPU and other resources must be managed precisely. So uh, with this information, let's talk about impact on Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, no, I, uh, so let's understand the stakeholders involved in this. And I really want to make you uh, understand what's really happening in the background, because uh, as users like the application developers, SREs, or the end users, um, probably that is something which is like like an abstracted level where, where they don't know what's really happening. So I want to give you some summary as to uh, when some uh, when any feature goes into um, Kubernetes, this is how it works where the application developers or SREs, they try to test that feature. If something goes wrong, they uh, collaborate with Kubernetes developers. End user customers, they also have some feedback. They also go with the same. and. Um, Kernel developers, uh, Kubernetes developers basically sync with kernel developers if they have any technical uh, understanding that they want to clarify regarding the kernel feature. So if you see here, the core uh, part of the entire workflow is the Kubernetes developers. And onus comes on them because at the end of the day, they want to maintain two versions, v1 and v2. So it's not about maintaining two versions. It's about um, you know um, fixing those, patching those, addressing the CVEs, it's a heavy burden. And uh, if anyone knows about it, Linux kernel community already um, not maintaining C group V1. So they haven't deprecated it, but they are, they are not maintaining uh, C group uh, V1 specific features at all. So something is happening behind the scene. It's Kubernetes developers. They are making sure that they are doing stuff at the Kubernetes level and not at the kernel level. So with this, let's understand the challenges. So there are two types of challenges here, the user-specific and Kubernetes maintenance-specific. Let's stick to user-specific. The first thing about this is complex dependencies. Uh, as you made aware, like, you know, once you have large applications with C group V2, uh, C group V1 specific behavior, it would be very difficult uh, to migrate that. And one of the reasons behind that is like a change in the behavior. I'll talk about that where, um, um, uh, I mean, later in the point where, you know, there's a point where behavior changes, and that was one of the point where people don't want to move to uh, V2. Then uh, user adoption barriers. Sometimes users might be very comfortable with C group V1, and that's where uh, they want to uh, move to hybrid setup. So, so there's a case where I was going through one of the blogs where the Java developer was uh, talking about things where they are having C group V1, 
V2, and they basically backported some of the features from V2 to V1. So ultimately, they are using V1, V2, and combination of V1, uh, V1, V2, which is working for them, but it's not sustainable in the longer run because every single um, uh, you know infrastructure stack is moving towards V2. So this is this is something which we need to address early because at some point of time they might be in a situation where they they'll face the issue and and things would be a little complicated. <laughs> then the behavior change. So I was discussing about it. So let's say user is on V1, they move to V2, like uh, through uh, cluster upgrade. Now, uh, you know, in C group V1, how uh, umkills work, like in uh, C group V1, when one process uh, gets uh, killed, other process, uh, sorry, when one process uh, inside the container gets killed, other processes are still running. However, with C group V2, it has a unified hierarchy. The moment one process gets killed, the entire uh, container gets killed. Now, uh, here is the PR which got merged last week, where what we are trying to do is like we are trying to match, uh, they already moved to V2, but we are trying to match V1's um, behavior in V2, which is strange, but at the same time, I can understand from their perspective that they want to support users at some point of time. But this kind of stuff will not help and not sustainable in the longer run because um, when when someone moves, like if the infrastructure moves to V2, they have to switch their um, infrastructure to, to respective version. And last but not the least, that we already covered about application not optimized for C group V2 uh, may face un uh, you know, unexpected behavior and performance issues. So uh, with this, let's let's discuss also about uh, Kubernetes maintenance. So that is something that comes on uh, Kubernetes developers. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you are aware about uh, Kubernetes test infra. We are actually maintaining uh, two versions. Like there are two uh, like um, equal coverage for both both V1 and V2. So there are set of jobs. One runs for V1 and second for V2. And since we are moving towards V2. I think um, you know making that um, investment in uh, you know um, running V1 specific jobs is not sustainable. Though uh, Kubernetes has not deprecated V1, but at some point of time they're going to do that. And uh, last but not the least, a legacy maintenance. So this point is uh, more for um, downstream uh, Kubernetes distributions where their customers are still on the older versions and they want to support uh, C group V1 specific stuff. Uh, because for upstream, anyway, we do EOL uh, and I think it's only got EOL 1.25, but yeah. All right. So uh, uh, future looks really bright. You know, we already started. Um, the first thing that we did was uh, C group V1 into maintenance mode with Kubernetes 1.31. So what does that mean for user is like, we are not going to develop any new features, though we are going to fix the security issues, but there's no assurance on uh, fixing the bugs. There is also plan to deprecate C group V1 sooner. I was supposed to um, mention the date, but you know, there are a couple of things, you know, uh, uh, let's say uh, the first issue about runtime spec there, we are discussing about synchronous um, announcement across different uh, projects to make sure that if someone is on one version, um, they should get that announcement and they should move to uh, V2 to make sure that they don't break anything uh, unknowingly in the production environment. And uh, third point is about identify the stack changes. So yesterday itself, um, SIG release master node uh, job for Cryo was failing. And one of the reasons for that is underlying system was using Fedora 40, Fedora Core OS 40, and it moved to Fedora Core OS 41. So what Fedora does is like with uh, Fedora 41, they are no longer going to support C group V1. Even with the kernel line argument, the only way to uh, support uh, V1 is through systemd uh, environment variable. That's like a hack around. But uh, that was the issue and, you know, um, at some point of time, we need to think like how we want to proceed and um, how we want to fix this stuff. And last but not the least, uh, we need to publicize the feedback about transitioning to uh, C group V2. Now, um, I don't see that happening, but like 
probably that happened for Kubernetes in general, but probably we should start having that uh, information about uh, you know, uh, V2 specific, uh, like let's say user is actually doing some testimonials. That way they will get some confidence in V2 and they'll start moving towards um, V2 in future. All right, um, I'll just conclude this with, you know, as we wrap up, I'm, uh, I want to emphasize our confidence on uh, C Group V2's uh, potential to manage advanced um, um, workloads. So tooling and collaboration happens across different uh, Kubernetes projects to so make sure we have that integration in place. And we are also trying to have um, refinement in place to make sure we boost workload and uh, compatibility and observability. So with this, um, those who are on V1, I'm hoping uh, this presentation help you understand uh, what's really happening behind the scene. And uh, I'm going to assure you like what really happening and um, there's a thing where, you know, um, moving to V2 is uh, not only beneficial for your projects or products, but it's also beneficial for the larger ecosystem. Let that be Linux or Kubernetes in general. So with that, I will leave you with one, uh, this picture that really depicts what, what the choice you have, like whether you want to stick with C group V1 and be in the darkness or move to C group V2 and be in the sunshine. With that, thank you so much for uh, attending this talk and yeah, I'm open for questions. Any questions? Questions? questions. Yes. Hello there. Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you for wonderful uh, talk. This was really good. I have several questions, and one of them on your slide, you mentioned that for Red Hat 8, as a support is optional, right? But e maybe it's a silly question again, but if we look at the kernel version there, it's kernel version four, right? And yeah. these features for C groups V2 are for Absolutely. kernel version five. Yes. So this means that it's like, it's some kind of limited support in Red Hat 8? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, so I pulled that information from Kubernetes guide itself, where um, with 4.0, uh, like whatever that version is, there we have limited support with C group V2, but with 5.8 we have like the full, like, you know, the GA support where you can, uh, you know, easily move and without any uh, problem, uh, okay. probably on the production uh, clusters. Okay, thank you. So this is the first one. The second question is about swap. So I was also attending yesterday the, C the Signal no, uh, discussion, and they were saying that it's kind of not yet ready because of yeah. the eviction manager uh, integrations yeah. that they're doing. Yeah. Would you provide any brief insight, like what what is the challenge that they're facing, like on that front? Is it like you know when to decide when to evict and when to OM kill and when to like you know move to swap like what what is the well we are still discussing that detail in signal meeting probably i don't know the exact integrity but um we can discuss it probably after this um, session okay for sure okay thank you yeah yeah first of all thank you for a great talk it, you went into quite a detail uh, so you mentioned with c group v2 uh, with memory.max and memory.swap.max you have the option of like, can we oversubscribe memory across all our pods on a node, kind of how you can do with CPU mm -hmm. and not run into um kill kind of issues with there. But how will you achieve that? Probably need to do that at the kubelet level. But if you have like, no, uh, you can uh, easily use C groups controllers to, uh, you know, uh, to control that. So why do you want to kind of do that at the kubelet level and uh, try to force it? So basically put more pods with a total, some total memory more than the node has available and it should be able to manage it with swap, assuming swap's enabled. Enable. Swap, uh, yeah, I think um, that's an interesting question actually, but I'm not sure on that side of things. Okay. Probably to discuss that, but um, there's a chance we can do that, but yeah, I'm okay. not quite sure. Cool, thank you. Yeah. I think we are on time. On your one slide, you mentioned about the, the umkill change um, PR that I think you said it was just, just pulled. Is that going in 1.32 or? That was 1.31. Uh, so C, C group V1 is going in maintenance mode, which no, no, means. No, the, yeah. the, the change where you're talking about the difference in umkill between uh, V1 and V2, and you said that there was there's one PR that 
maybe was back. Uh, yeah, so uh, it recently got merged into main branch. So probably it will come in 1.32 for sure. 1.32? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Probably. Okay. Thank you.